Yeah, hello again, engineers, makers, hobbyists, all the fans of this great subject, electronics and programming. Welcome back to our lab talk. This is our, I think, Matthias, our eighth show. Uh, so, uh, eighth our seventh, seventh show, we, we start counting. Depends at how we calculate. Yeah, there was a half show in between. Yes. Okay. But um, let us introduce again, this is Matthias from ElectroLab, our side. software expert, so to say. Yeah, at my side, Jens Nickel, editor-in-chief, Electron Magazine. Hello. And yeah, let's start with the announcements. Um, we had last stream a giveaway, the Electro US Siren kit. And we have. And these are the winners Fabian Schwartz, Danny Liebert, Wojciech, I don't know if I pronounce it right, Wojciech Stolili, Roland Riemens, and Günther Bendisch. Congrats. Yeah. And also this time we have a giveaway. And as the topic is analog antics, um, we are giving away the ebook circuit simulation with Tina Design Suite and Tina Cloud. Five ebooks of those. And with the ebook comes an uh, included one year subscription for the Tina Cloud. So you can <coughs> use that to train with the book and do digital and analog simulations. And we will come back to this uh, yes. in the show later. Uh, yeah. That's uh, our introduction, and yeah, you already said something about uh, analog is the subject of today. Yes, because mm -hmm. um, analog is something we will face every day. The world isn't digital, the world is still analog, and it will ever be. And so it's not uh, just digital circuitry that you have to deal with, but at the end, at some point, you will end up doing something analog. and. We thought let's talk a little bit about that and some basics that maybe have a little bit for gone forgotten in the past. So yeah, to, to show that there is more than just your GPIO pin on your Arduino. On the other hand, you can do a lot of great projects just connecting modules with some wires. Yes. And you just un unbox uh, the kit and you will draw the connections and the rest is software. Yeah, exactly. Um, and these analog things are a good topic. We have a sponsor for this show, a late arrival. So if you switch to the side camera, yeah. yes. So sponsor of this show is LabNation with their smart scope. Um, their smart scope turns your tablet, laptop or smartphone with a single cable into an oscilloscope. And um, you can check it out at the Electro store. It's currently on sale. And besides being analog um, oscilloscope with two channels, you can hook up. You have also at the other end eight digital inputs you can also use as logic input and also use for logic or signal generation. So it's a quite handy device if you're on the go and don't want to carry a full scope around or if you just on your desk want to measure if there is something happening on a signal, that's a really nice way to do it. And yeah, also um, with the giveaway of this week, how it works, someone of our team already put in the chat, hopefully put in the chat, ElectroTV, I mean you, um, what the code word is that you need to enter at the registration page. So we have set up as last time a registration page, a link is in the chat already, so check it out. And you need a code word that will be TINA in capital letters, check the chat, chat is leading when it comes to the code word, um, enter your required information and maybe you will be one of the five winners of the ebook. With that said, um, yeah, let's move over. Should we announce when the next 
lab talk is? Or oh, we can do this at the end. I would say just begin with our main subject, analog and yeah, on the other hand, digital. But okay, these these are not contraries. That's these these things are combining, of yeah. course. Um, yeah, Matthias, we already said there are a lot of maker kits out there. Um, just you just have to unbox um, a board and peripheral modules connected together. And yeah, with demos, with examples, you already come to really great uh, projects. Um, yeah, and for this subject, we have a guest in our show, yep. Matthias. Make is a really good uh, keyword for that. Yes. Maybe we can introduce from Make. Hit the right button. David Groom. I hope we get that right. Hello, David. You have a to lot of people. Him. Uh, um, I'm David Groom. People online probably know me as iShotJR. I'm the community editor for Make, um, which means. I write the magazine. I, I mean, I help write the magazine. I help organize uh, other authors and edit their work. Um, right now, we're um, wrapping up the 2022, 2022 version of our uh, board's guide, uh, which will be out in November 15th, I believe. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time hands-on with a bunch of different dev boards and uh, trying to figure out which ones uh, to include and which ones to highlight. Um, my title of community editor also means that in addition to those editorial tasks, I'm also um, highly involved in the community, um, creating connections, hosting and participating in live streams like this and other events. And uh, I'm definitely coming more from the digital side. I'm more of a maker or hacker. And uh, we've already had some great uh, discussions about some of this stuff in, in the pre-show. So, I'm looking forward to learning uh, more of your thoughts about the importance of analog in all of this. Uh, great, David. And I see you are well prepared with magazines. One question from me. Uh, how is the scene uh, in the States at the moment? I think you also were, were suffering from the pandemic. There were no make affairs at all. Is it uh, going well? Is it uh, continuing at the moment? Yeah, so I mean, there've definitely been a lot of uh, of impositions on our hobby. Um, our local makerspace, for example, um, we've definitely curtailed the number of activities that we're able to do. Um, as you mentioned, uh, for a, a long time there were no make affairs. Uh, they're starting to pop up again now as uh, different areas become uh, comfortable or able to to host events. I'm going to uh, make a fair Lille in France uh, next month. So that's happening, but it's definitely put a damper on things. And the other thing, um, which has really impacted everything, and I have a piece that I wrote coming up in the next uh, magazine, is <clears throat> the chip shortage or, or supply, yes. supply chain issues in general. And, uh, you know, the impact of that on your ability just to even get the dev boards that um, I'm writing about in order to be able to do basic projects. So yeah. yeah, we definitely felt some some difficulties in, in the recent years. Okay. So, um, but I think uh, there were for, for everybody were a lot of time. So the people really could develop um, nice projects. Do you see some development there? Is it turning maybe more to Raspberry Pi or away from Raspberry Pi, or is there some development you can... Wow, I see? love these questions. This is, yeah. uh, <laughs> this, this is playing right into uh, the next issue because we're covering yeah. all of these topics. And uh, the observation that we've um, seen um, here at least is uh, due to the unavailability of a lot of um, you know microcontrollers and dev boards and components and just even really basic things, um, we have seen a lot of uh, shift, and especially in the maker community, uh, a lot of that has gone to the RP2040 mm -hmm. and the ESP32 mm -hmm. because those are available. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't get, you know, STM32 um, until 2024 or something, 
then you've got to come up with another solution. So that's where the, okay. the availability of some of these other microcontrollers has been coming in. And we've been seeing definitely in the maker sphere, a ton of adoption of these chips. Uh, I don't know how much that is propagating into sort of, you know, industrial automotive and things like that. But in terms of maker projects, it's RP2040, ESP32 everywhere right now. Okay. Um, Matthias, yeah, we, we said um, digital is a lot, but not all. Yeah. Um, the maker should also know a little bit about the uh, electrical properties of a GPIO pin. Yep. I mean, for example, David mentioned the RP2040, and mm -hmm. I think the RP2040 is a really good example if you talk about the ADC in there, because there are a few you have to know what it is and you have to read the data sheet carefully if you want to get accurate measurements. For example, if you just use the Raspberry Pi Pico board, there is a note in the data sheet that says, hey, if you want really, really accurate measurements, as good as the chip can do, um, please change, for example, the voltage reference. And yeah, that's that's something, if you if you have played with, with analog, that's something you know. You know that your reference is key to a good measurement at the end. So I, I brought some props. Uh, I, I have all kinds of props, but one I was excited to, to share. Um, in terms of analog fundamentals, I actually uh, found this. Someone was giving this away at the side of the road uh, a couple of weeks ago, and this is pretty much what I what I learned the basics of electronics on a little two hundred and one kit where you connect the wires to the little springs and things like that. So. That's kind of where I got my fundamentals, but um, my degree is in computer science. And uh, in that, in that, the approach there is more modular. You know, you pull in libraries, you have all kinds of dependencies, um, even like, you know, grabbing code snippets from, from places and things like that. And so it's very sort of architectural, top-down uh, building blocks um, <clears throat> as opposed to um, what I'm finding with the with the analog side of of hardware is it's much more bottom up. Like you have to understand mm -hmm. all these things in order to be able to do these things. Like I know we're going to talk about an op amp, but even to understand an op amp, do you ha do you know what transistors are and things like that? So it's very interesting for me coming from top down, having a big vision for something, and then only really getting into the weeds as required if you you know, run into bugs or things aren't behaving the way they're expected, as opposed to, I think, the more electrical engineering approach of knowing all the fundamentals and then building up uh, with those building blocks to create something. Yeah, but sometimes knowing these fundamentals is hardly paid. Usually you learn the, the best you learn is from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for the analog stuff, um, yeah. The, the thing with analog things is they are not just working or not working, they are in a state in between, and that's sometimes really annoying. Yes, yeah. yes I think, um, David, work as, as expected, that's a good keyword. I think as long as um, this um, maker kit can really connect things uh, together and it's working, how it's um, described in the manual, then you really can, you can extend the software, you can modularize the software, think about cool features. But if it's not working as expected, then um, you, are, you are bothered. For example, um, the ESP32 Pico kit, um, it, um, it didn't start uh, up sometimes after you um, um, interrupt the power and power Power on again, yeah. so um, there was no software um, updated, um, and that that was really first a hard, hard to find error. So if you don't have this deep knowledge, um, you really wonder what is happening and why it's not working. And it's a simple reset um, thing, which you can solve with a 10k resistor, for example. So, and there, yeah, yeah, you have to have some knowledge. Um, of course, if the years go by, the months go by, you can Google it. Uh, somebody else found um, the problem. But, okay, there are, there are the hiccups. 
I think Matthias, mm-hmm. you know other other things. Uh, yeah, I mean they are they are. It's like tales from the past and STM is is uh, mm-hmm. a nice uh, topic for that. There was an STM part from the STM32 series. Um, if you want to get the full ADC resolution with all the available bits, like almost no noise on the signal, uh, you had to turn off almost any other peripheral to, to reduce clocks and something like that, because you get an error and an, and a noise source from within the chip. So uh, that was also something, yeah, you, you, you start to struggle like, hey, why are the last four bits or five bits that that wonky it's it's the voltage it's it's perfectly delivered to the chip and then you see where does it come from and you, you're starting wondering what it is and so it's it, something like that is that something that you um inherently knew from your experience or was that something you picked up uh from the data sheet because i, f- I feel like uh again making the software comparison um where you kind of take these building blocks hopefully it all works if it doesn't you know, you start Googling <laughs> and uh, maybe find some discussions of people that had similar problems. I feel like the two ways for me coming from the top down are, are always uh, either that same scenario of finding someone who understands this stuff better than me on a discussion forum or or just asking your friend who's uh, who's more of an electrical engineer or um, just having studied the data sheet and said, you need to put this 10K capacity here. I don't know why that is. You said you said I got to put it there. I'm going to put it there. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, which, which of the scenarios is is the STM32? Is that from data sheets or from experience? Or? Sadly, from experience. That's one of yeah. the kind of it did cost money mistakes or, or knowledge you gained during yep. the years. But in the end, there's also a layer of of academic knowledge down below. So, I I did. Um, my studies uh, in microelectronic systems. So uh, yeah, HF techniques and, and also things like uh, ground bounds and stuff like that uh, were part of it. And so you, you had a feeling like, hmm, okay, that looks weird, but it, this is okay, it could be, because there is something in your, in your knowledge base that says it could match. Have a closer look at that one. It could solve the problem or fully mislead you for months. So, <laughs> good and, and when you're taking a closer look, how are you? How are you doing that? What is the actual physical process that you're going through when you're taking a closer look? Um, if it's an analog problem where I suspect something in the analog pass is, is wonky at that point, um, the first question is: Okay, did my analog uh, to digital converter do its job right? So, did I feed the the? Is, is my voltage supply clean? Or clean enough to do the job I want to do. Um, do I have the chip itself as a source of noise inside my, my power rails? Is um, are the capacitors uh, in, in the right spot? Are they close enough? Um, is there something in the data sheet, for example, that tells me that there is an, a certain bug like first conversation don't trust after one microsecond? I think the AVR has something like that in the, in the data sheet like throw away the first conversation, then you can use it, it's good to go, as long as it don't stop for, what was it, 128 conversation cycles, something like that, and then you have to throw away again the first conversation. So there's, there's something in the data sheet mentioned. So somebody called it, uh, it needs to get to operating temperature, so sort of, um, but yeah, it's like there's a hardware bug somewhere in the chip. And that's something you get from the erasure sh- uh, sheet, if you're lucky and they document yeah. it <laughs> or you get it somewhere in, in the forum like hey i have this weird problem and it seems like it's connected to this so these are the, the two options but you you get a feeling okay first check is is your heart is, is your hardware really doing what it should is it working according to the data sheet more or less and after that you go through the signal paths so you start for example if you have some signal conditioning um, is there something in it voltage divider for example not working is is there an operational amplifier that converts for example current to a voltage so for the 4 to 20 milliampere loops it's nice to have at the end a voltage because your analog to a digital converter likes to have a voltage and not a 4 to milli uh, 4 to 20 milliamp current yeah and then you use this yeah a scope or yeah, pro- probably a good scope 
to probe around and see if there's something introducing an error that you don't want to have. So that's the awesome. academic way. Move yeah, the path yeah. around. Uh, I was not, I'd never heard of the AVR issue that you mentioned. Uh, it's kind of interesting to me just because I've been getting into, uh, you know, we were talking about some of the, um, some of the projects uh, I've been working on uh, when we were talking before the show. And uh, one of those is actually that I grabbed is, um, is I've been getting into, you know, uh, bare metal AVR programming mm -hmm. um, using, uh, you know, AVR GCC, AVR Dude directly, as opposed to uh, relying on the Arduino ID and just uh, letting it magically handle everything. And, um, you know, there's definitely been times when it didn't flash uh, or uh or you know it even appeared to flash but the code that was running was very clearly the the previous iteration um but what's interesting to me about uh the process you described is i'm only ever going to assume that's because i'm doing something wrong i would never assume that one out of 128 flashes was actually expected to fail so that is uh that's really interesting <laughs> Uh, it's 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 for the for the ADC reads. So, oh, look look in the data sheet, and it says yeah. if you if you use the the analog to digital converter, and yeah. usually you you do the start sample, set up everything, do the first conversation, mm -hmm. grab the result, and depending on the chip and and maybe even on the revision, it ca it could be that your first conversation is definitely completely off, that you have to do a second one, and then you're good to go and. The options you have, let the ADC run in the background and con uh, do conversations as long as the chip runs with all the ugliness that comes. Because in the datasheet, there are a few lines stated, if you want to have a real nice conversation, do please the following things, turn off the following peripherals, turn off the following clocks, let it do its thing, keep the chip quiet, and then you're good to go and can continue. So. Yeah, I, I miss I misremembered or mis misunderstood what you're saying. I thought you said the first time you write the flash is what I thought you said, not the first time the ADC got it, got it. No, but okay. still, knowing knowing that problems aren't necessarily my fault is uh, is kind of a, a new and unique <laughs> thing to think about. Uh, there is uh, with with microchip. There is one famous or infamous chip. That's the um, PIX32 EC uh, from the MIPS generation. So the counterpart to the to the uh, upcoming uh, Cortex parts, as long as Microchip was on that route, and the EC had in its data sheet a 14-bit ADC, 28 mega samples per second with four sample and whole, so four simultaneous sampling channels, and there was a hardware bug. In the end, they ended at 500 kilo samples with seven bit. <laughs> so a little bit off spec, so, but yeah. it was clearly stated in the data sheet at the end. Hey, there's something wrong, and you can't fix it. We, <laughs> yeah, we, but we have to say this: this problem is not restricted to hardware. Of course, if you have a, a bug in a software library, then you are also uh, in in the middle of nowhere, because you do not expect this. You first think uh, you didn't use it in the right way. Yeah, um, but this also can happen, of course. So I think that the best thing is keep keep wondering and keep keep um, asking questions. Do not rely on on something. Yeah. Maybe that's a good uh, approach. Yeah, some, sometimes grabbing your measurement equipment and have a look what the real world mm. does around your chip mm. can also make your day a little easier. So, Matthias, what what? Can can a digital guy like me do to get analog knowledge? Um, what what's the best? Is it still uh, building your own radio uh, with some parts, or what? What is the best approach? No, yeah, no, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they are analog fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So, like, um, why does an LED need a resistor as a current limiting uh, device? So, how does that work? So. Why don't you connect directly an LED to a GPI open? So that sort of base knowledge you should get. What does it Let's say this base knowledge is there. Um, how can you come further? For example, the, the electric properties of GPI opens. There are some hiccups, of course, and each GPI open is a little bit different. Um, 
Yeah, one, where, where, where can you get this, this knowledge? I think there are also books. Yeah, one, mm. one thing that's, that's quite common and, and mm. I think that's uh, with, the, with the module making a little bit underestimated is uh, the art of uh, using operational amplifiers for jobs. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Admiral now has the uh, AVR 128DB that features an integrated operator, operational amplifier so that you can condition analog signals. For example, you can amplify those. Um, you can sum or subtract uh, signals from each other. So let's say, um, David, you may know the, the uh, ACS 712 current sensor module. Those split out an analog signal and uh, zero um, amps is at 2.5 volt or VCC half. So what you could do is, okay, I, if you say I don't care about the current that goes in reverse, you want only the positive part is use an operational amplifier and subtract this offset, for example. And this is quite easy. Or you can do it in software and hit it with a little bit more calculations. That's the two approaches. And if you are short on calculation times, you can do it in an analog way. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a nice thing you can do with operational amplifiers. And the circuitry for that is, is not that complicated. And an op amp usually uh, has two inputs. You need a bunch of resistors um, for the operation as addition or subtraction or multiplication. It can also do quite nicely. So, would you buy a kit with all the all these components, or would you say, okay, what order you, order what, these 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 chips yourself, um, order a set of resistors? What, what you can what you can do in the first place um, is, if you want to start with operation amplifiers, get a book, mm -hmm. get a good book, and try reading about the operational principles of that. And if you want to do some experiments, yes, you can take out your breadboard or you can take a simulation um, software. Okay. Like uh, the Tina Cloud, for example, is one of those. You can use um, LT Spice that works also, depends on your flavor you like to use, and can do a first simulation run, for example. Put an operational amplifier, put a little bit of analog circuitry around it, um, like you would put on a breadboard and start a simulation. And if that goes in the right direction, then you, start, you could start building the analog parts on a PCB or on a breadboard because with a breadboard or a PCB that comes a little bit more analog fun to it. I, I have an answer to this question of my own, actually. Okay. <laughs> so um, I know we were talking about different projects and things like that. And uh, one of the things that uh, I, the kind of things that drives me and uh, creates interest in, in this stuff uh, for me is uh, music. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my approach to learning a lot of these things has been you know, uh, either buying a kit that uh, has to do with these concepts or even uh, coming from the other direction, just trying to do something and realizing that I needed these concepts in order to uh, realize the thing that I'm uh, trying to achieve. So I actually grabbed this because uh, I knew we were going to be talking about op amps, but this is a, oh, it's covered up. Which way do I need to go? There we go. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a little kit that uh, uses an op amp. It's just uh, a little kind of Atari punk console um, with uh, some photoresistors um, to uh, give it sort of like a theremin. Here, let me see if I can actually get oh, it working okay. here. Yeah, oh, mm -hmm. here we go. I don't know if you guys can hear this, mm -hmm. but got sort of theremin mm -hmm. abilities. You can change the shape and tone mm -hmm. of the signal. So that's another way to learn about op yes. in my opinion. <laughs> That's how I learned about them. Yeah, and I think there are then two fundamental different approaches. The one is the maker approach, mm -hmm. seeing a problem, putting together a solution from available components, or the more academic approach like having a look into it, make a plan, try to build it, and see what problems could arose, work around it, and in the end, see how to get it working or not. Yes. Okay. So I have a question. I mean, uh, the op amp itself, that's a module, that's a building block. What's really happening inside there? It's just uh, a bunch of transistors, right? Like, do yeah. you need to, do you, how important is it to understand 
you know, keep going down and keep going down into the individual sort of subcomponents. Um, yeah, I mean, for the for the operational amplifier, uh, it's enough to, to stop at the at the chip pins for the moment. Mm -hmm. To, uh, to learn how it basically works, how, it fundament how the fundamental... But of course, you, you have to know the properties. Yeah, that's, the that's for sure. properties from the data sheet, but then I think you do not have to understand the inner of oh. the problem. Is it, is it open uh, to the public, the, um, for, yeah. the inner circuitry of an op-amp oh, normally? We, or? Uh, we sold, I don't know if you do the, the Med Scientist micro a741 operational amplifier these these mm -hmm. big I love with the, all the the on the wall i have i have the 555 i don't mm -hmm. have the their op amp one but i have the 555 which is exactly how it works inside that's yes. so good yeah. yes yeah but that's only one type of course yes yeah. a very popular type uh, but for the other types do do the um manufacturers uncover the the inside of the, 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 the only as blocks, I think. Uh, only roughly. Mm -hmm. So the, the deep, deep, deep silicon details that's in there, no, they are not given to the public. So you know the how it should work, what components of building blocks are inside this op amp. And what, yeah, about, so what about different types of op amps? I know uh, in, in the Pico Pasta that I just showed, it's a 324AN rail to rail op amp. Um, so it's not just you have to know about op amps, you have to know about the universe of op amps, right? Yeah, it's 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 a whole, you could say it's 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 more or less a science for itself to, to choose <laughs> the right one. But yeah, you're right, there are operation amplifiers, uh, you said rail to rail op operation amplifiers, that means they can have their output set to their supply voltage. The um, se uh, 741, for example, is not in rail to rail. So it will stay, I think, 1.5 or 2, uh, 2 volt below the operational supply voltage on both sides, minus and uh, negative and positive. So yeah, you have to choose the right one. And then there's also which bandwidth it's capable to deliver, which gain you can get, what uh, supply voltage you can apply to it, um, how is the noise that it's introducing uh, over the temperature range. So there's, there's a whole universe out there that you can choose from parameters and yeah then you can make the solution based approach take a module that has all the stuff in it and use it and if it's work working it's okay or you can say okay let's do the more academic approach see what would we need what par parameters would we need to have for the chip and then go selecting which one could be interesting I think you can um, um, simulate uh, s special types of op amps also in simulation programs. Yes. How good are these simulation programs in terms of really the real properties of that kind of op amp? Um, it highly depends how good the data set is, but mm -hmm. you can go really, really far with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in terms of saying would work or would not work, if you go to the edge cases, to the mm -hmm. absolute edge cases, mm -hmm. it's, it's then really Okay. Yeah, simulation in real world could differ, mm -hmm. but there are also basic models for operation amplifiers. Um, I have prepared a small addition circuitry. Mm -hmm. uh, should be HDMI input. Yeah. This is a small addition circuitry with an ideal op amp. That means infinite um, gain, um, rail to rail. Uh, no noise, so an ideal part. You can also get uh, models for real parts, but the simulation will mm -hmm. get really close to the real world, but never be as good as the real world, but close. That's actually a Tina Cloud? Yeah, that's actually mm -hmm. something uh, thrown in the Tina Cloud. Um, mm -hmm. It has a five volt supply. It mm -hmm. has a uh, 2.5 volt um, signal um, that is uh, fed into one uh, that it's uh, to a summing point it has a 2.5 volt offset and as you can see um, this will add a DC offset to your um, signal and at the end you have then 
uh, yeah, your, your DC offset in the signal and then the uh, yeah, oscillating or in this uh, moment sine wave on top of it. And you can also do it in the opposite direction. You can also have that DC offset, a signal with a DC offset and remove the offset from it. Okay, and you have also two test points yes. here where you can grab the signals. Yep, and then you can mm -hmm. see what the okay. result would be. Mm -hmm. And I said these are ideal components. But this is, uh, for example, if you need to, to add two analog signals, you can do it with two ADCs and do it fully in software. Or you can use an operational amplifier before that and your signal pass and then do the ADC stage behind that. And depending on what you need to, to solve, it could be quite interesting. Um, uh, besides the summation, you can also do subtraction. Sub uh, mm -hmm. um, to see where the mouse is. It's hiding somewhere. Is that should it? Ah. So, um, this one will do the opposite. So, the circuitry also operation amplifier will remove a DC offset from the signal so that you can get only the sine wave that's on top of a DC biased signal and work with that, for example, if you don't want to have that. This also gives a nice addition. If you add a second stage, you can amplify this sine signal and use the full ADC range. So you can have a better resolution within your ADC and may get away with an 8-bit ADC where you otherwise would have to use a 10 or 12-bit one. So if you can max out the range in that point. Um, so it could be, or well, this, this is a nice way to do signal conditioning for your microcontroller. And yeah, uh, if you so there are, there's a set of, of basic circuitries for the operation amplifier, and doing that in this lab talk I think would be a little bit beyond what the lab talk does. That's more for a webinar to talk about these basics in depth. Um, another circuitry that's uh, that you can use uh, didn't have prepared that for example is a current to voltage converter. So if you have an, an 4 to 20 milliamp um, current loop, you can use an operation amplifier to get a voltage between 0 and 5 volt in an equivalent uh, proportional one. So you can use your ADC and see what the signal should be like. Uh, so these are the interesting things for the operation amplifiers. And I said some vendors uh, start to include them in their chips. And it's really nice because you save on one component and can do all in your microcontroller and condition the signal as you need for that one. And there is a little bit more uh, for the analog world to talk about. Um, as David said, audio is an application that is still analog and really depends on good analog electronics at the end. Whatever you do in the digital pass before that, at the end, you need to go into the analog world and you can do many, many things that are not nice for the signal. But for that, uh, we had two shows ago, Tom Giesbertz, that introduced mm -hmm. the uh, Fortissimo, the uh, an, an monoblock 100 watt amplifier. And yeah, I think uh, if that is going to the sh uh, store, we will have it again also to talk a little bit about the analog challenges and amplifying signal with 100 watt output. Yeah, but back to the analog world, there's, there's more to the story than just the operation amplifier. Your voltage source you have, you usually use, um, most will use an, an still uh, 11, 17, dash 3.3, 5.0 from put vendor here, <coughs> um, ST, uh, who's doing that all, um, Texas uh, analog, so the, the default line regulators, and they also have analog properties. <coughs> so if you, if you put in a voltage that has 
noise on it or a noisy offset on the DC signal, it will still be in the end of, of the uh, low dropout voltage regulator. But you can minimize it. That's another nice trick. That, that brings me to um, a nice story from Burkhard Kainka you will find in the November-December edition. Okay. And there he gives quite good tips how to uh, build prototypes, analog prototypes, also with, with higher frequencies. He, he's using um, actually um, a kind of um, metal, um, metal plate. I'm not sure if it's from a Pringles cup or something, if it's metal plated. And there he, um, he um, solder his components and he says there you have a kind of mass, uh, yeah, there you have a kind of mass uh, layer mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and you get very good results, better than on a breadboard. So you can read the story in November, December, uh, tips about PCB design. Burkhard Kainka. It will be in the news and sales beginning of November. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's mm. also a nice thing mm. to, to do with doing prototypes. And um, it sometimes turns out in a kind of art. If you see this, this dead bug style mm -hmm. layouts where the chip gets turned around on the wrong side, glued to this copper board and then mm -hmm. wired fully on the board. And it's, yeah, kind of an art and also a nice way to do the analog prototypes. Um, yeah, speaking of that, I mean, we have now talked how to get analog in the chip. I mean, the RP2040, for example, has also set the analog to digital converter. Um, the interesting thing is also how to get uh, your, your digital stuff from the chip to the outside world. So there's also some, some things you can do. And... Yeah, um, what you can read, what's, what's coming up is, uh, for example, how to use an R2R ladder to get an analog voltage back from your GPIO pins. I mean, that's also something that's, you, you need to know that it's there. Mm. You need to know what the limitations are, but you can get really good away with, yeah, just a few pins. And if you're really into that topic, you can also, for example, generate a small video signal. So. Your, your AVR breedboard is uh, enough to generate an, an composite uh, black and white video signal to build your own game system. That's so cool. I know we were talking, uh, again, I brought a lot of props. And one of the props I brought that uh, we were talking about that I was really uh, excited to discuss um, when we were chatting b before the show was uh, the, old, uh, the old propeller. Um, I think we're, we're both fans of this, uh, this multi-core uh, microcontroller and specifically the uh, the Hydra uh, was a game development um, you know in a box basically it came with like a keyboard and mouse and mm -hmm. uh, and everything you need but it was propeller based and uh, you know it came with this giant I don't know 800 page book 600 page 7, 800 page book uh, which included you know how NTSC signals work what the V blank is things like that uh, which I just found fascinating, but I've never, you know, the, the propeller is pretty um, strong in terms of its kind of multimedia capabilities, but I'd never, um, I'd never really thought about uh, what it would take to get something like that out of a simple AP AVR, so I'd love to hear about that. Um, we can, we have a running demo actually on the desk, and awesome. all, it, all it takes are two resistors. Yeah. So... Let's switch over. Um, so we need to move a few parts around and hopefully don't break it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, what you can see or almost see in the back is uh, Arduino Uno. So something that's left. Um, just ground two wires, two resistors, 1K and 470 ohm connected together with pin D7, D9. And then you can see you will get a composite signal that you can feed into a monitor. And that's it. Uh, resolution wise, uh, it's uh, 128 by 96 pixel. But with enough creativity, you're good to go to do Pong or whatever you like to do. Is it a real-time calculation? Yes. Okay. Sort of. 
So um, you have a, uh, the uh, you're using um, I think 50 percent of the RAM as a frame buffer. Mm -hmm. um, store monochrome pixels, so eight pixels are stored in one byte, and then uh, two timers are used to shift out the pixels um, to the display, and works quite nice. Mm -hmm. there, there are a few more tricks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, you can, yeah, if, if you like, you can, there are things like, like Pong, Tetris, uh, what, whatever you like to do with just uh, these few components. And it, it's, it's, I mean, if you have, if you are starting, it's, it's a nice play. And if you have a scope, looking at the signal and seeing all the uh, sync pulses and the timing for the um, Paula NTSC, you can do both. So depending on which country you are in uh, or which region, you are in, um, yeah. You can, if your if your tele set has still one of those inputs, you can feed it to it. Yeah, that's that's composite video. I can imagine that it's that it's real, realizable. Yes. But uh, what what was a surprise to me is that um, HDMI and, and and modern digital signals are also now in the reach of of maker friendly. Yes, the, um, the RP2040. Controllers. The RP2040 did a great job with that. Mm -hmm. And there are a few really nice demos for the for the uh, DVI output of the system. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, but you have to understand a little bit how the signal is generated and what trigger you need to get the right amount of data and the right bits and the right encoding to the right channel and with the right voltage that your display realize, hey, well, that's something I can display and I can work with. Yeah, and all people who are interested should watch out to our January February magazine. Yes, we will talk. You are currently already writing the cover story. Yes, so uh, it will cover video signal generation with the MCUs, MCUs as as an as an artist, uh, mm -hmm. and will cover the composite VGA and also the DVI output capabilities of certain microcontrollers. So. Also showing a few tricks that you need to pull off uh, to, to get the signal with the right timing out of, of, out of the chip. So it's quite... You know, when I, first, when I first saw that, I was blown away. I was thinking, you know, if you, when you think video output, you're more likely to reach for a Raspberry Pi with, you know, built-in mm -hmm. HDMI, things like that. Um, and then I was remembering, you know, the first Raspberry Pi had a composite output. Um, but then uh, the more I thought about it, at first I was just kind of blown away to see this little 8-bit uh, AVR uh, doing that like gorgeous uh, wireframe 3D rendering, basically. Um, but the more I thought about it, I thought, um, you know, a 6502 and a, and a couple other chips used to do that, <laughs> uh, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. So uh, as impressed as I was initially, I started thinking about it a bit more and I was like, I guess they. I guess that's not that far from you know those eight bit days. Uh, no, but the interesting thing is, if you look at those older systems, sixty five or two, most of them, most of them uh, had some additions to help. Yeah. Uh, the ZX uh, eighty one had a little bit of custom logic around it, but the CPU was yeah. mostly doing the heavy lifting, and later yeah. systems like the um, Atari. 2600 had already an, an uh, assistant chip that will would do yep. all the graphics and, and graphics generation. C64 has also a graphics capable chip, not as no good known as the SID for the sound unit. Oh yeah. Uh, and the SID, oh, um, speaking of that, um, there's a reason why a SID emulation is that hard. The filtering that the chip does uh, that's done analog in the chip. So there are a bunch of resistors uh, inside and depending on the chip and the charge and uh, the day and uh, the, the way the chip aged, every SID chip will sound a little bit different. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's then... funny because uh, we're talking about the propeller and um, one of the things about the propeller is it had those eight cores and they were very modular in the way that we've been um, discussing, you know, the modularity, uh, top-down uh, maker modularity versus bottom-up academic uh, approach. And that was one of the things you could do with the propeller is just sort of 
grab some code, run it on a core, and not really have to really understand much about what's going on. That was one of the first things I, I did on my propeller was there was a SID chip emulator and uh, and you know made it made a little synth out of it. Um, so that's fantastic. Yep, there's just a question in the chat about the wireframe renderer. There's the TV out library for the Arduino Uno. And there's also the wireframe generation or rendering in the sample code included. Um, so if that's the answer for the chat, um, look for TV, TV out in the libraries. It's a little bit older and with the current IDE you might get some interesting error messages. You have to move around a few code files and then it will compile and it's good to go. As you can see, it's freshly compiled, uh, one hour old, out of the compiler, and the library still works and can be used with the QN 2.0 Arduino IDE. And nice. I can highly recommend, uh, if you need to stick to the Arduino IDE, you may have a look at the 2.0. The editor has improved. Yeah, I just did a blog post about that on, on our site the other day. I've been following it since, you know, the early days as the Arduino Pro ID. It was originally called before they kind of changed it to 2.0. And so I've been I've been waiting for it to come out and, uh, you know, release uh, fully as the 2.0 version. Um, but I've been, I've actually, you know, I think around RC3, I tried to just switch to just use it and not use the uh, 1.8 at all just because I wanted to, get into the new thing, especially because the it's all based on the CLI tools, and I love the CLI tools. They're just, uh, they just totally changed the game for me, honestly, being able to do, I was trying, you know, I I basically tried to do CLI tools with, uh, with the 1.8 uh, IDE, just because that's how I prefer to work with my own different code editor. Um, but ever since those came out, I've been loving those, and then now they're just part of the 2.0 IDE, so I've definitely been using that and recommending it to everybody, so. Glad that came up. So for the maker community, a question that arises, should they try at some point to have a little academic look into the analog world? Absolutely. I'm, I'm definitely going to, I'm definitely, you know, as much, uh, whatever experience I've had in the past, um, I feel like it's one of those things that atrophies if you don't need it. Like, uh, I honestly had to, had to brush up a little bit on things um, so that I would feel comfortable uh, talking about this stuff today because just, you know, not something I, I've uh, had to dive into uh, on a regular basis, but um, just uh, hearing some of the stories, uh, hearing, seeing some of the examples and demonstrations and things like that, it's definitely something I'm going to be uh, diving back into a lot, I think. Yeah. I mean, with the analog trickery that's involved in, in signal generation, uh, yeah. The AVR can do amazing things. Mm -hmm. uh, there was way back 2010 the Fasor demo, so a little bit overclocked uh, clocked with I think 28 megahertz. It was able to generate a full color pulse signal with some with some little analog trickery around it. So really really nice if you if you really know the stuff that you can do. So I think a little look into that beyond the digital ones and zeros don't hurt. Yeah, now I'm excited. Now that you mentioned that, now I'm like, is there an Arduino or an AVR demo scene? Are there people, you know, pushing the the graphical uh, capabilities of these 8-bit chips to create, you know, crazy demos? And I'm very intrigued by that idea for sure. Yep. So, yeah, and as I said, the, the other thing is audio. So not just mm -hmm. grabbing and getting data in, but also getting data out. There are many, many interesting ways to do that. And I think also have a look at that uh, won't hurt at all. <laughs> yeah, and for the time we are... Five, five minutes to, to seven o'clock. Um, yeah, before we do our announcements, our regular announcement, David, do you have some very interesting or surprising project on your desk oh Can projects huh? sure <laughs> i have tons let me see okay. Uh, okay. i, I kind of grabbed some random stuff just to talk about in case it came up but okay. let me see what we've got going on uh, i know one i showed you guys before that's kind of interesting it's going to look a little bit strange in its current form but but try not to be too afraid um 
I don't know if you're familiar with sort of the companion robotics uh, scene, um, mm -hmm. but there's should of building little friends out of uh, servos and microcontrollers. And uh, this is my, my cat bot I've been working on. And um, it's pretty simple. It's, uh, uh, it's actually the Arduino uh, version of the RP2040, the Nano Connect. Okay. Um, again, use that because the, uh, my favorite BLE sense is not obtainable right now. Um, and I actually originally wrote this in C, uh, just because that's what I'm more comfortable with. But I wanted to start playing with CircuitPython a little bit more. So I, I rewrote it in CircuitPython, which has been an interesting journey because uh, some things that I would take for granted, like interrupts, don't really exist in the same way in CircuitPython. So that's been kind of interesting. Um, what else have I been working on? Uh, I showed you the, the bare metal AVR. That's kind of been an interesting journey. Uh -huh. You can see there's a lot of retro stuff around me. And another thing I've been working on, again, just because I'm interested in getting more into embedded Python is, um, so this is the, uh, the keyboard feather wing. And I have uh, just an old particle argon on there just because it's a, a feather that was I didn't mind you know replacing the firmware on. Um, and I used it to make sort of my own little fantasy uh, retro computing uh, uh, device. Uh, you know, when I was little, I always dreamed of having a computer in my pocket. Now everybody does, but I wanted to make something a bit more like the uh, the old school stuff. So I don't know how well this is going to show up, but, you know, it's it sort of simulates a, uh, a, a sort of Commodore 64 or BBC Micro or one of those oh, kind of nice. uh, machines. And you can sort of type some commands into it and... Uh, and, and it'll do some of the, uh, you know, I haven't got like a full basic implementation or anything yet, but uh, it's just another little little fun project. Um, I've also, uh, I don't know where it went. Ah, another thing I've been really into, speaking of retro, is uh, uh, I don't know if you remember these, uh, but the HP Palm Tops. Um, these are little DOS-based uh, x86 machines, and uh, I've been uh, learning how to how to write apps for those and how to get them online. And, uh, you know, whenever there's retro stuff involved, hardware sort of comes up uh, because a lot of the time stuff isn't working. So, um, well, with that one in particular, there's some modifications you can make. You can swap out the crystal to uh, to double the speed of your CPU, basically. So I uh, did that mod and, uh, and uh, also uh, added some RAM uh, to it via sort of a hidden feature that's inside there. Um, yeah, I could go on, but how's that? <laughs> can, can we read something in a Make, in a Make magazine? In no. Um, oh, what I've been doing in terms of the magazine mm -hmm. is just uh, all of these boards. Just uh, I've just been hands-on with all these boards, going over all these specs, uh -huh. and uh, and trying to pick what what we think is the most interesting thing. So. In terms of the magazine, all of my projects uh, or all of my uh, time has been spent, you know, putting together uh, this stuff uh, for mm -hmm. our boards guide. And uh, so no no specific projects for me in this one, um, but there are a bunch of other cool projects um, from other uh, contributors coming up in the next one, uh, which I suppose I should uh, take the chance to plug. Uh, it'll be on newsstands uh, November 15th. And um, you can uh, subscribe to it both in print and digitally if it's uh, not something you want to get shipped to you. And uh, you should also check out our newsletter as well and subscribe to that so you can uh, stay in the loop on all these things. Okay. Matthias, what do you have on your desk at the moment? For the moment, um, exhibition preparations beside, yeah. the, beside yeah. the article, but yeah. <clears throat> But, but before the big exhibition, Electronica in Munich, that's the keyword. We will have uh, also a webinar, Matthias, and it's called Wireless Wonders. Why wireless? Because that's the subject of our current um, Electro edition. It's wireless. You can get it at the newsstand sales at the moment or get it in the shop, of course. If you are not a member, <clears throat> um, yeah, Bluetooth Low Energy will be also the subject of this webinar. Yep, and a little more. Uh, yep. So we will have a look at, at BLE, 
go to uh, a mm. demo project for a uh, Bluetooth low energy connection between two mm. devices, in this case ESP32 and ESP32C3, uh, exchange data and see also that the current consumption will drop. Mm -hmm. um, but don't get it misinterpreted. Bluetooth low energy as a wireless technology will be using less energy than other technologies out there, for example, Wi-Fi. The ESP32, on the other hand, if transmitting data and running, is not in that moment a low power chip. So it will still consume a few milliamps, so 60 or 100 milliamps while it's running. So you have to do more trickery if you run on a battery, but it helps. So, yeah. and, uh, and before that, we have uh, engineering insights from our colleague Stuart Cording. Yeah, they are talking about embedded Linux. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. For example, uh, they have one guy uh, that will talk about the Yocto Linux, and mm -hmm. also uh, one of his guests will talk about containerized applications and how to do it in a way if one application crashed that it won't kill another one. Mm -hmm. So this could be really interesting. So if you're into embedded Linux, may have a go for that engineering insights. Looking forward for that one. Yes, and ourselves, you can watch again in the next lab talk. Yes, that will be the lab talk before the electronic right exhibition. before the electronic exhibition, yes. So we will have a short talk about that mm -hmm. and also with winter coming and getting colder uh, a topic will be um, saving energy doing smart temperature control sort of saving gas yeah or whatever you use as, as energy source to, to heat your rooms there are a few things you can do and also we will ask at a certain point the question home optimization to save energy until which point it is useful and at which point it will consume more energy than it saves. So if you're into that, tune in. And yeah, if you want to gain more knowledge, uh, yeah, have a look at the webinars uh, that are coming up. So Great. I just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, hype up my host here. I've got my latest elector here in addition to, to make, uh, I think there's a pretty good, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're quite different magazines, so I think people mm -hmm. can enjoy both. And yes. I've been a subscriber, I've got them all on my shelf over here going back at least a decade. Uh, so grab your elector as well as your make. <laughs> yeah, never a bad idea. So, yeah, then we are at the end of the show. All announcements done, giveaways done. David, many thanks for joining. It was really a pleasure to talk with Me you. Me too. Yeah. Maybe we we'll meet at some exhibitions or make affairs. I hope, hope so. so that yeah. Was. Yeah. Yeah. And then thanks for watching. Have a good night or have a good day, depending on your time zone. See you soon. Bye. Bye.